Urbanization is a trend within Europe, and the young generation is leaving the countryside and move to cities. But living in a crowded city can be overwhelming. And sometimes it's good to retreat into nature. Most of us think that for wild nature, we have to travel to the other side of the world. But in Europe, we are facing a historical change. Because over the past four decades, wildlife has made a significant comeback here. Wolves are crossing borders, the bear population is increasing, and vultures are roaming the skies. It seems that Europe is rewilding, and using my bushcraft skills, I am going to film it. I'm taking you on an adventure. power working? I'm working on it, just connecting it, fixing the solar panel right here. Hey, morning man, let's start a base camp. Yep. When I'm filming in the great outdoors, I usually create a base camp, a safe place where we come back to, where we need to recharge our batteries, restock on food supplies, and most importantly, get some sleep. In Europe, we grow up in a landscape where everything is managed. We believe that if we don't try to control nature, it will become inhospitable. But right here, in the Velibit Mountains in Croatia, they stimulate natural processes. They believe in rewilding nature and not controlling it. I've been in this region before and I noticed a lot of bear activity, but this time I would like to locate them and film them. The Velibit is the largest mountain range in Croatia, located along the Adriatic coast. This sparsely populated area still remains relatively unknown to tourists. I am on my way to meet Nino, a nature guide who can tell me more about this area. Well, Berebit is a very versatile mountain. We have three different types of climate. We have continental, mountain and uh, seaside climate. We also have different types of habitats. We have forests, we have uh, open grasslands, we have uh, deep valleys. This area used to belong to shepherds and to farmers. And uh, because of the urbanization, they moved to bigger cities. Now the nature is taking over and it gives a new opportunity for wildlife to come back. Every healthy ecosystem has carnivores inside it. So here on Velabit we have European brown bear, wolf and lynx. I really would like to find and film the brown bears. How are they doing actually? The population is growing, the hunting regulations are doing good for them. People are huh, mostly okay with them, but uh, there are still quite a few people who are not happy to see the bear. I think the threat of conflict with humans and the frequently negative portrayal of them in the media makes it even more difficult to protect them, is that right? Definitely, definitely. Well, uh, the bear attacks on the humans are rare and they are not fierce animals. In 99% of time they are running away of people because they see people as a threat. I think that people need to go to nature, experience nature, uh, discover that the animals are not a threat to them and they are part of the of the ecosystem, they are part of the mountain, the symbol on the mountain and yes. they need to be here. Apex predators such as bears and wolves can be among the hardest animals to conserve, especially in Europe. These animals require large areas of land to roam and sufficient food to survive and flourish. They help the ecosystem to become healthy. Nino is taking me to a valley with the most bear activity. Even though the size of the brown bear, finding one is not easy. Hey, it's the first time I see pine trees. I find pine trees so fascinating. The trees around us are called black pine trees. 
and indigenous cultures have used pine needle tea for medicinal purposes for thousands of years. Did you know that one cup of pine needle tea contains four to five times more vitamin C than orange juice? Pine trees are evergreen and the needles come in clusters, usually from two to five needles. If the needles are not in clusters, it's most likely a fir or a spruce tree. But be careful, you don't take the needles from the yew tree because they're poisonous. I'm going to collect some so I can make a tea later. Here we are. This is the place on which we can find bears. Wow. We're gonna look for bears in this entire place or? Yeah, we will go here on the meadow. On the meadows. Yes, and then we will stay and we will see if the bear comes out. So whereabouts do they spend most of the time then? Most of the time they are on the meadows, but when the rain is starting they are going to the forest. Uh, I will go to scout in the forest for tracks and you can go the, to the meadow. Okay, sure. Meet you in a bit. Okay, All see right. you. The European brown bear is crepuscular. This means that they are primarily active during twilight, the period around dawn and dusk. But sometimes they are also active during the day. Guys, come over here. I got something. It's a clear track. The European brown bear is an omnivore, which means they have the ability to survive on both plants and animal matter. Their diet consists of grass, insects, fruit or roots and bulbs from specific plants. And what I found right here is a patch of plowed grass. And bears do this when they seek for specific roots of plants or when they just look for insects. Their huge front paws and long claws make them powerful diggers, as you can see. Right here. Hey. Hey. What did you find? I found the bear activity. Did you see any bears? No, but I found a tree trunk which is on which bear dug up the larvae inside the forest. I think it seems like a good area to film bears, so um, I'm thinking about staying here for a couple of days, uh, just to set up my hide and see if I can spot and film any bears in the mornings. Yeah, it's okay, that's okay. Uh, we shall split it up. It will make us easier to spot a bear and we have a bigger chance to spot one. Yeah, I agree. Um, let's turn on the radio and check. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it works all right. See you in a bit. Right see you, man. Later. Later. The brown bear has an incredible sense of smell and excellent hearing abilities. Nino leaves me to increase the chance of seeing a brown bear. We will only stay in contact through the radios. As a wildlife filmmaker, it is important to have certain outdoor skills. You need to know how to navigate, identify animal tracks and set up a temporary shelter. When you are camping in the wilderness, away from civilization, it is important to know how to ignite and build a fire. A fire keeps me warm, I can dry my clothes and I can disinfect water and make it safe to drink. I collect dry wood from a dead tree, preferably one that is still standing. Making an open fire is not always the best option. I don't want to draw any attention and I like to keep the fire small. So in this case, I prefer to use a portable wood stove. I want to be a few meters away from other trees and have a flat surface. In this situation, I have the base of an old tree, so that's perfect. I've collected some dry twigs and wood, but I can feel it's a little bit damp on the outside. So I need to process it. And I can do that by using my knife and another log. Now you can see, it's dry on the inside, so I can put this in the wood stove. 
Of course, the easiest way to ignite a fire is with a lighter. But sometimes, because of environmental circumstances, or you run out of fuel, or just simply lose your lighter, you can't start a fire. So it's always good to know several ways of making a fire. I personally like the flint and steel. And I found this piece of flint here in the velibit among the limestone. And it's basically a hard rock. And what I have right here is a piece of high carbon steel. So if I strike the piece of steel along the sharp edge of the piece of flint, I get some sparks. So if, I, if I'm able to get a spark here on a piece of char cloth, So there's a quick one. As you can see, the char cloth is glowing. I'm going to put it inside the bird's nest. And there you go. So now I quickly lift up the wood stove. I hold it above it. So as you can see, the small twigs and a piece of birch bark that I put in the wood stove are actually picking up the flame. And I'm just gonna let it roar. And then I'm gonna make a nice cup of pine needle tea. I'm gonna prepare my camera and put it next to my hammock in case a brown bear comes into my camp in the middle of the night. Let's hope not. rising already. I think I have to bring my height because I'm too visible for the bears right now. The reason why I bring a portable height is because I think that the bear spotted me this morning already. The height also kind of prevents that my scent is going all over the place. I think this location is quite nice because uh, the sun rises around 87 degrees. So that's in the east, that's over there behind that mountain. And it goes all over the way over the south and sets in the west. And ideally I would like to shoot from an angle from the sun's direction because it creates more depth in my visuals. Um, as you can see, we have a lot of spruce trees there. During the day, most of the time, the bears sleep. So for me, it's just a matter of waiting inside this hide until it's twilight and the bears come out of the forest. 
So I think I have a pretty good place. Now I'm gonna go into my tiny house and hopefully film some bears. <laughs> There's nothing moving, really, except the grass, which I've focused on many times already. Hide is not waterproof. I start to wonder if I'm like in the right place. Hopefully, have more luck tomorrow. Nina to Awi. Awi to Nina. How is it going? Not so good. The weather is pretty bad. It's raining and pretty strong winds as well. My hide is also not waterproof and I had to put on the rain cover. If it keeps raining like this, the bears will not go out. So we don't need to relocate. Yeah, that's what I thought. I checked the weather report and it says that uh, it will stay. This, this weather will stay like this. I know the place on the south. I think the weather will be better on that side of the mountain. Yeah, that might be a good option. How far is it? I will send you the GPS coordinates of my location. All right, I'll pack up my gear and come tomorrow morning when the weather is maybe, hopefully, a little bit better. See you tomorrow. Over and out. Come on, let's go. <clears throat> Watch your step here at the, those branches. It's beach, bilberries, mountain ash. The effects of rewilding are clearly visible. The abundance and variety of vegetation makes this place feel like a European jungle. Cornelian cherry, bear's favorite. It's incredible to see how nature can bounce back if we let it grow by itself and not try to manage it. I arrive on the other side of the mountain and immediately I find promising signs. So what I found right here is a scat of a European brown bear. And as you can see, it has a lot of seeds inside. One of the most important functions of the brown bear is seed dispersal. They spread seeds through their scat and are essentially like farmers. By planting seeds everywhere, they promote a vegetation community that will feed them in the future. I have traveled to the exact GPS coordinates that Nino gave me. And um, it's actually my last chance to see them because unfortunately I have limited time over here. No bear activity so far.
My time here in the Velabit Mountains has unfortunately come to an end. This area really felt like wilderness, and I am so happy that I was able to visit this place. It's clear that the rewilding program is giving nature a chance to bounce back, and I hope that the wildlife within this area will have a bright future. Thanks for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Next time, I'll be facing extreme conditions in search for wild nature. And I'm wondering, what animal in Europe would you like me to film? Please let me know in the comments and I'll see you in the next episode. So this is how actually the van of the film crew looks like. It's like mess everywhere. Food, food, camping gear, dirty shirts, there's some dirty underwear. You gotta get used to it.